Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining me. Let's chat for a few minutes about The Day the Sun Died by Jan Leonke, which is a book that I recently finished reading, and following this chat, as usual, I will touch base briefly on what I am currently reading. But for now, let's spend some time with The Day the Sun Died by Jan Leonke. From what I can tell of its publication history, this was published back in 2015 in Taiwan. This is a Chinese author, but I think many of his books have uh, run afoul of the Chinese authorities and so have not been published in China. And this one was published in Taiwan. It was published in English last year in a translation by Carlos Rojas. So this book came to my attention through Flipboard. So do you guys have Flipboard? Um, you know, I have, I have a Flipboard thing set to uh set to books and you know you can just uh flip flip news i won't say that it's really um uh, in-depth news about books but um it's a, a when you're feeling fidgety it's a a thing you can do uh you know and and anyway uh this book popped up on that an article about this book so um that's how i learned about it and you know, it just sounded like it was uh, something that I was going to enjoy um, very much just based on the subject matter, which I will discuss here more in a bit. But then in reading more about it, I discovered that this author won the Franz Kafka Prize back in 2014 and was on the Man International Book uh, Man Booker International Shortlist in 2016 for one of his novels called The Four Books, and then was a, this particular book won the Dream of the Red Chamber Award, which is a, a book award from Hong Kong in 2016. So um, I think this book might have a slightly different title in Chinese, but this is the how they're translating and how it's published in English is The Day the Sun Died. Um, yeah, so what it's about is we have a young kind of 14-year-old boy whose name is Lee Nianian, and he lives in this sort of isolated-ish mountain village in central China, and it's a hot summer day. It's kind of a typical day, really, for this uh, period, you know, for this uh, season, um, but the people in town are just sort of trying to stay cool and whatnot. Um, at, but as the st sun starts to set at about five o'clock p.m., as the you know the evening is beginning, that period of time between afternoon and evening, um, you know there's a there there some people start to sleepwalk. It's called uh, dream walking, where I believe if I remember right from the book, the first person that our young uh, narrator uh, sees doing this is a man walking to the fields to, I think, uh, cut wheat or thresh wheat. Um, and he's like sleepwalking, basically, but talking and interacting with his environment, but in a state of sleep, which they call dreamwalking. Um, and so through the course of this one night, the whole novel takes place over the course of one night, um, then the the dream walking um, becomes very widespread, um, and uh, our young narrator Lee Nianian, um sort of narrates these events to us. So um, I will just uh, I thought I'd read there's a there's a, a paragraph from the book that really sort of describes of sort of setting the scene for the whole story, and um, it's talking about this hot summer afternoon, early evening. Um, and it says someone else had brought out an electric fan and placed it in the doorway of his house and the fan's blades sounded like whirring knives. Everyone was chatting while either sitting or lying in front of the fan. The town streets were just as they had been and the entire world was just as it had been. But actually the world would never be the same. The great somnambulism had already begun. The footsteps of the dream walkers had gradually begun to enter my village and my town. The somnambulism blotted out the sky and blanketed the earth, leaving everything in a state of chaos. No one knew that the somnambulism was already hanging over us like a dark cloud. Everyone assumed that what was overhead was simply a dark summer night's cloud. People assumed that this summer night was like any other. So sort of a typical typical day, but um, things were about to really change in this village. Um, 
So uh, of this family, so Lignanian's family, um, his father and mother, um, his, uh, I guess, uncle, his mother's brother, runs the sort of the village or the county's crematorium. And his father and mother own a funerary shop, which makes items for funerals like paper wreaths and paper items and items that uh, are used in, in, the ser in funeral services. And... So early on, um, the government uh, had decided that all bodies had to be cremated. All, de all the people who died need had to be cremated instead of interred in the ground in order to save, you know, earth, save space for um, use, like farming and whatnot. So this sort of went against tradition and against cultural practice, but um, it was really strictly enforced. And early on, uh, Lenianian's father had participated in this uh, sort of, uh, I guess, informing on people who secretly buried their uh, their relatives, um, informing on them, and then would earn some money, and then uh, officials would come and actually blow up, uh, as to set examples, would blow up the, the graves, and the bodies would be disinterred and then taken off and cremated. Uh, so... Um, his father, though, is really consumed by guilt for this for this action. Um, so, would this guilt that his father has actually would play out throughout the entire entire novel? But also, something's going on in the crematorium. Something kind of creepy, actually. The uncle is. Um, as the bodies are cremated, he sets the temperature, a certain temperature at first, so that the bodies are rendering an oil called corpse oil. And this corpse oil is supposedly, you know, valuable. I did a little research on the internet just to see if, you know, what, as I don't really know what cremation practices are, like how bodies are cremated. From what I can tell, this is not something that is done during cremation, that the entire body is consumed, including any fat or oil that comes from, from the body. But in this particular book, this corpse oil, Oil then is saved in these big barrels and the uncle can take these to another another city and sell them because they can be used in all sorts of industrial products. Well, the father um, sort of gets in this business where he gets, um, gets his brother-in-law to sell him the corpse oil um, at a reduced price, uh, sort of, in, you know, in respect of his sister. Um, and what, but what he does is he, unbeknownst to the owner of the crematorium, unbeknownst to his uh, to Linianian's uncle, his dad is actually storing the corpse oil in these barrels in a cave, which no one knows about, uh, but which will become very important. It's like the Chekhov play, you know, when you put a gun in, in the beginning of a play, it's got to got to get used or whatever that goes. If you put corpse oil in the story, there's going to be a reason for it later on in the novel, which I'm not going to give away because I don't want to give away any spoilers uh, about this uh, at all, really. So I don't want to detract from anybody's pleasure in reading it because this book had a real tension that builds over time. Um, because, you know, the the, the Dreamwalkers, um, they start, it starts very small. Uh, so there's smart, very few. And then um, as time goes on, more and more people sort of succumb to sleep and become Dreamwalkers themselves. And so, it becomes bigger and bigger movement and then neighboring villages hear what's going on in this village and some of them come in to take advantage of the situation right because if everybody in town is dreamwalking asleep and unaware of what they're doing then um, you know all sorts of mischief can be done so another kind of really interesting way that the story is told, um, it, it marks out time. The, story, the chapters are in time segments. So these time segments are a Chinese time segment called a gang, I think. And I think, I, if I remember that right, I, I did not write that down on my notes, but a gang, I think, G-E-N-G. -E and this is some sort of unit of time measurement in China that I'm not familiar with. But then the subunits are sort of Western time, like time like we would know. So... And, and it just, uh, it's different time periods, like it might be only be a 20 minute time period, but it proceeds from, I think it starts at about 5 p.m. on this late afternoon, early evening, and then proceeds till the next morning. So another interesting thing, though, about this uh, novel is that the author himself appears in the novel. So a character called Jan Lianki appears in the novel, lives in this village, and is a writer. There are references, from what I understand, to lots of his writing that are actually sort of parodies, or not really parodies, but they are um, 
uh, similar, very similar to his actual books. And our character Liniani, and the young 14-year-old boy, reads his novels a lot and so uh, quotes them quite a bit. But uh, from what I have understood in reading some book reviews and things of this novel, that that from people who have actually read other novels of Jan Lianki, which I have not yet, but um, that the quotes aren't quite right either. So I should mention about Linianian. He's 14 years old, but he's um, his nickname in town is Shanianian, which apparently means stupid Nianian. So he's known as not being all that bright um, in the village, but yet he is our, he's a very cute observer on this night of the great somnambulism in this uh, village. So um, one thing that I would like to say, I think, about the book is how how this drama, how the tension builds in it. So it starts out, as I mentioned, very slow with just a few um, dream walkers. But, um, and so these are really individual acts, you know. So individually, um, there are all sorts of people take all sorts of individual action when they're in this state of dream walking. Some commit suicide, some do crimes some um but then you know there's we have um another character um a young girl who works at the crematorium she starts planting flowers all around the machinery of the crematorium in her dream walking state so you know on an individual level it's it's very personal like this i think his mother at one time was dream walking and she's making the little paper uh funeral objects out of paper that she can do um during when she's dream walking i should say also that people can wake up from their dream walking state and when they wake up they just go what was I doing? Why am I out in the middle of the street, you know, in my uh, pajamas or whatever? So they can, and then they can go back to sleep. So uh, this uh, occurs throughout the, the novel as well, where some people come in and out of this dream walking state, and then others are in it pretty much the whole time. But like I said, so there's this individual level, and then it's a group level. So it kind of progresses to a group level, and groups can do all sorts of things, right? So if you think about groups, some groups are you know, nice, and some aren't, <laughs> right? So um, groups, you know, may go from being bands of thieves, for example, to um, a neighborhood where uh, it's sort of a debauched party in a wealthy neighborhood in the middle of the street. So, you know, groups. And then the whole big society is a bigger group where factions sort of divide off into how society should be run, either this way and this way, or this way. And I thought this was real interesting because this book is largely mentioned as a sort of a critique of Chinese society, but I think it's really quite universal because there's this faction that wants to take uh, the government back to a past, a glorified past, uh, a glorious past, and then there's the the uh, group that wants to move into this glorious future. Uh, no one seems to want to stay in the present. They're either trying to work for some sort of um, goal of a progressive sort of uh, changing revolutionary future as opposed to some sort of glorious, um, illustrious lost past. So I thought that was kind of interesting and also very universal to the human condition. You know, finally, before I run out of time, I just wanted to say, you know, this is a long night. This night ends up lasting because of reasons that are I won't go into, but the night ends up lasting longer than a normal night. And it just, uh, I think, illustrates uh, how much humans need light. And a uh, key point is if we don't have light, how we have to make our own light. Um, and that is a key point is what happens at the end of this book, which well, I will not give away because it would be a spoiler. But yeah, humans need light. If we don't have light, we have to make our own light. So I will leave with this chat with that little cryptic sort of last uh, last comment. So what I am currently reading, um, let me just open it up real quick. Uh, I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful. Just want to touch base briefly on what I'm currently reading. Uh, I am currently reading uh, Verena by Charles Fraser, and I'm a, more than I'm between a third and two thirds of the way through with this book, and it is really good. It's a historical fiction set in the 19th century, middle 19th century American, mostly in the South. Um, this pertains to Verena, who was the wife of Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy during the Civil War era. So it's been very interesting. Verena is a very interesting character. Charles Fraser draws this period really well. He is the author of Cold Mountain, which is also sets set in this sort of civil war era of the south so what i'm going to read next i'm not exactly sure i have also finished the happiness hypothesis finding modern, modern truth in ancient wisdom by jonathan Haidt, which i will have a chat on coming up 
I have a chat on this coming up very, very soon. I haven't decided exactly on what I'm going to read yet, but I think it's probably going to be a nonfiction. I have tons of stuff queued up to read, tons of really good stuff queued up to read. So I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to choose next, but I think it's going to be a nonfiction. I will announce that when I do the chat for the Happiness of Hypothesis. So stay tuned for that. Until next time, take care. Bye.